Michael reads books. Today we're going to be talking about this book, Cloud Atlas. If you haven't heard of this book, you might have heard of the movie based off of it, which was a Tom Hanks and Halle Berry film. There's a bunch of other people in it. It was kind of a box office flop, but it is actually one of my favorite movies. Um, I have it as well. I haven't seen it in quite a long time, but it's such a good movie. I think it was a flop because people didn't really understand what was going on. So Cloud Atlas, written by David Mitchell in 2004, um, comprises a number of different stories that take place in different times and have little uh, to no influence on each other. It takes a few reads or watches of the movie to kind of figure out what's going on, but basically all of these characters in each of the different time frames um, are karmic reincarnations of each other. And they're connected through um, little symbols, like there's a birthmark that pops up, there's music that pops up, and it's just going through the lives of these different souls as they inhabit different characters and beings throughout their lives. The movie is absolutely phenomenal. Um, I saw the movie first before I read the book and it actually made me want to read the book. But this is one of those movies and books where um, I feel like the movie is a lot better than, than the book. I've seen the movie quite a few times. I've only read this book once. Um, but what I read in the book was not as good as what was portrayed in the film. The movie kind of jumps around all of these different stories, um, but in the book it's written kind of in a different way where you have the first book at the very beginning and the very end, or the oldest story at the very beginning and the very end. And then you have the next oldest at the beginning and then the end and then the next. And it kind of sandwiches its way up to the like most futuristic story. I'm just gonna kind of highlight a little bit of what happens in each of those stories. I don't wanna give you away um, the whole story in case you haven't seen this movie or read the book and you wanna do either one. And I do highly suggest watching the movie. Not so much reading the book. I mean, the book was good. It just, um, it kind of flattened a lot of the kind of epicness that was in the movie, if that makes sense. I'll explain a little bit later. But the first story in the book, and I'm pretty sure in the movie that is featured, is the Pacific Journal of Adam Ewing. In the movie, Adam Ewing is portrayed by Jim Sturgis, who everybody probably knows from across the universe. And it's set way back, way back a long time ago. Um, Adam Ewing is this like accountant who's in like, I, I don't remember, like like Malta, like that area, I think. Um, and he's booking a ship back home to America. His whole storyline in terms of changes from the books to the movie are pretty much the exact same. There's not much different. It's about his voyage. He meets some guy who he thinks is his friend, kind of gets sick. He helps a, um, a black stowaway on the ship that's heading back to America. And that black stowaway ends up up saving his life and it's just sort of the um, karmic response to that it's not the best story um, in fact in the book it's pretty tedious to have to read that at the beginning and the end because the writing is just so old-fashioned so it, it's it's not my favorite story <laughs> in the whole you know cloud atlas anthology the second story is my favorite story in this whole anthology um, in the books it's called letters from Zettelgem. Zettelgem? Zettelgem. And these are letters written by Robert Frobisher, who is portrayed by the amazing Ben Wishaw, to his friend Rufus Sexsmith, who in the movie is portrayed by James Darcy. Now, this is one of my favorite stories in the films, and I would say in the books too, even though the books kind of ruined it for me. Um, in the film, Robert Frobisher is kind of like a young, arrogant, upcoming musician who goes to this house of this old composer named Vivian Ayers, played by Jim Broadbent. And he kind of like works with him and helps come up with a symphony with him, the Cloud Atlas Sextet. Now, Ben Wishaw is one of my favorite actors. He's absolutely incredible in some of the stuff that he's done. Um, a lot of people might know him from the James Bond movies where he recently played Q, um, but he's amazing in movies like Lilting and Perfume, which is one of my favorite films. So the whole premise is that uh, Robert and Rufus are best friends, but they're also um, lovers. They're gay lovers. And it, this is set in a time, I think like it's the early 1900s or the late 1800s, something like that. So it's a time when that's not really accepted. A whole bunch of stuff goes wrong. There's a fight between Vivian and Robert um, that goes pretty badly. But the whole thing is just very romantic and romanticized. And in the film, the relationship between Robert and Rufus is so like visceral and real. Whereas in the books, um, it's kind of not as potent. You know, he takes the LGBT aspect out of it and kind of squashes it and makes Robert very bisexual, but leaning and preferring towards women, which didn't do it for me. <laughs> 
Um, I love Ben Wishaw. I love the way he portrayed this character in the film. In the books, it's just it's a watered down version of this um, this love that he has for for Rufus. And um, I think the fact that in the book it kind of watered down the gay aspect of the character that really just changed my um, my perception and my enjoyment of of this story really in the book. So the next story is called Half Lives, the first Louisa Ray mystery. And Louisa Ray is portrayed by Halle Berry. This takes place in, I think, like the 70s or the 80s or something like that. And Rupert Sexsmith actually makes a cameo in this story. It's Louisa Ray piecing together a mystery about a nuclear reactor that is being newly commissioned and opened for everyone, even though it's not really safe for it to be doing so. In terms of like the interest of this compared to other stories, it's probably in the same boat as the, as the first story. It's not the most interesting story in in this um in this book or in this movie um but still in the film Halle Berry does an excellent job at it and it kind of pieces together some of the characters at this point you can kind of see like oh this character is this character from this past story this character is related to this character from this story so you kind of get a picture of like who people are and this is where you kind of feel like okay I kind of I know what's going on these people are being reincarnated over their different lives and we're seeing how their lives are interconnected and the way their karmic patterns from the past life are affecting this life. The fourth story which is one of my favorite stories in the book actually it is my favorite story in the book not so much in the film in the film I love Robert Frobisher's storyline but this story is um, the ghastly ordeal of Timothy Cavendish and Timothy Cavendish is played in the film by Jim Broadbent. It's basically the story of this unlucky old guy who's made a lot of unwise choices and he gets put into an old folks home as kind of just like a joke from his brother but his brother dies and there's nobody to get him out of this old folks home um and he has to stage his own his own escape and it's it's pretty hilarious but in the book it's one of the best written stories in the book because the voice of timothy cavendish is just it's so profound it's very much, the whole time I was reading it, I could hear Jim Broadbent's character in my head reading out the dialogue. It's an incredible story. It's hilarious um, in the film and in the book. It's pretty much one for one in terms of storyline. Like, they're, they're pretty much the exact same. And it's just written so well. Some of the stories in this book aren't written, uh, like, they're not they're not my favorite. Uh, for example, the, the Louisa Ray mysteries were kind of short and quick, and there's a lot of different characters, and you had to keep track of them all. Um, it was kind of confusing after a while, and I'm not even sure that one was the same as it was in, in the movies. I don't know. But this one, The Ghastly Ordeal, was so well written, um, so interesting. The characters were hilarious. Definitely one of the best parts of, of this book in the movie. So the fifth story takes place in the far future, and it is called An Horizon of Somni 451. In the movie, Somni 451 is played by Asian actress Duna Bay, and it's one of my favorite storylines in, in the movie. In the book... Again, just like Robert Frobisher, not so much. So the storyline takes place in the, well, like near to far future. Basically consumerism has taken over the earth and there are these like clones that they're making that run the service industry, basically. They're considered less than human, um, they're replaceable. And so many 451 is one of these, you know, replicated humans. She gets liberated from the diner that she works in and kind of becomes enlightened. And then in the films, um, she and kind of this rebel group who are against consumerism set up shop on an island. And from there, she kind of feeds out her message to everyone. And it's got a very, uh, a very spiritual, um, new age kind of feel to it. It's absolutely incredible. As she's giving all of these like words to people, they're being attacked from the from the consumerist governments and she's arrested and her lover is killed and everything. And it's so beautiful um, just to see the like fight that these two have on this this very dark world that we are now living in. In the books, um, you find out that she was just kind of a pawn um, in the consumerist game and that she doesn't have as big of an effect on the world as she does in the movies, which is which I thought was pretty sad. Like so in the books, her, her, I'm going to give away a spoiler right now, but her, her lover in the books basically is not like on her side the whole time and is basically just put there to kind of guide her a certain way um, because they want to shut her down and everything. They want to shut this kind of movement down. So I was just really disappointed. And also in the, in the books, there's, there isn't really any of her speech that she has prepared at this, at this um, satellite where she's airing, you know, her 
her ideology to everyone. None of that is really shared. And it's such an important part of the film. And the lines, like the, the dialogue that she has in the film are some of the best like quotes that I have heard from any film. Like they're so beautiful. So I was really let down by this story in the book. Um, you know, the film does such a better job of capturing what the story should have been. So yeah, in terms of the book, this was the Probably one of the biggest letdowns. Actually, you know what? Robert not being fully fully gay or, or more gay than, than straight um, was definitely a big letdown too. But, I mean, in terms of epicness, this, this part of the story was definitely a bust. So the final story in this book is Slusha's Crossing and Everything After. <laughs> the main character in it is Zachary, who is in the film played by Tom Hanks. This is set in the far future, society has collapsed, and basically there's these little tribal communities that are surviving on the Earth. Um, there are some bigger societies with more advanced technology, but at the same time, they don't seem to be much more um, intelligent or learned than these little tribal communities. So this story, this story kind of just follows like really just Zachary's life, basically. He he meets this this girl played by Halle Berry. I can't remember her name. Um, and together they kind of like leave the island. I mean, there's really not much to that storyline. Um, it's not too different from the book than it is from the film, except that way more people die in the book. And it's kind of a hard read because, well, like the way that the way that it's written and everything is very. It's almost like language has de evolved into this very simplistic way of talking um, and the whole thing is written from Zachary's perspective so it's it's very hard to uh, read at first you have to kind of get a rhythm with everything and then just kind of force your way through it but that story is all encompassed in the book in one and then from there it starts ending the stories from all the previous ones so I was really interested in this book simply just because the film is is amazing and does such a really great job with kind of portraying different lives of souls as they kind of change throughout throughout timelines and stuff like that. The book, I, I would suggest, you know, you don't have to read this one. <laughs> if, if you have the chance to watch the movie, which is like a two hour movie, or read the book, um, I would say watch the movie. And I know that's kind of sad, but the movie is just, it's its a much better, more condensed, and more interesting version of the book. It makes its characters more profound than I think David Mitchell does in, in the book. It's still well written. I mean, some stories in the book are better written than others. But I would just say, you know, if you have the chance to watch the movie, I would watch the movie over reading the book. I probably won't read this book again. I read it once. Um, it didn't hold up to the film. Um, I'm still glad that I read it though because his writing style is really interesting and you can learn a lot from the way other people write, other authors write. So, was a good read. Wouldn't read it again. Let me know what you're reading in the comments below because I love hearing what people are reading because I would love to add some more books to my to-be-read list. I mean, I, I have an extensive to-be-read list, but it's always nice to add more books to it. And yeah, that's it for this one. I'll see you all in the next one. Thanks again for watching. Remember to like and subscribe for similar content. On Mondays, I post videos about houseplants. And on Fridays, I also post videos about houseplants. And reading, writing, photography, art, and any other generic interests of mine. As always, you can find my social media links in the description below. Also, you can find links to h, h Games, the board game company I've helped create, and our debut board game, Season of Heroes. You can also find the Amazon links to my fantasy series, A Chronicle of Crowns. Thanks for watching. Bye!